I'd like to welcome the Lakes Campus and the Edible Campus uh, to, uh, to the second week of the Shine series. We are working our way through the book of Philippians, and I have told you this strange story, or your campus pastor has told you this strange story about puzzles. Uh, my kids had the puzzle, it was the wrong box, that kind of thing. Well, here's the deal. Uh, I wanted us all to hear that story because I think it illustrates something that goes on with life. For just a moment, I was blindsided, or maybe you could even say blinded, by the reality that the puzzles didn't match the box top. For just a moment, I was, I was nervous. I was worried. For just a moment, I was lost, you know, just unsure. For just a moment, I had no confidence what I was going to do next. For just a moment, I was really concerned. And then I realized, oh, that's the problem. You see, the pieces don't add up to the picture, at least not the picture that I had in mind. The pieces add up to a different picture. And this illustrates something that happens in the lives of Christians all the time. We have a worldview or a big picture idea, things like there is a God and I'm not him. That's part of the big picture, right? His name is Yahweh. He has, uh, comes in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. We call the Son Jesus. We call the Spirit Holy Spirit. We usually call the Father God, okay? And those three interact in our lives. This is the big picture. If this were a puzzle, this would be on the box, right? Uh, our redemption and salvation comes through the blood of Jesus. We believe that because we have been forgiven of our sins, that our lives are then donated to God and He can use us as He wishes. And we don't do it alone. We get to do it in the confines of a relationship with other Christians in the church who together, these individuals, form a group that is following God and living out the will of Jesus and behaving under the direction of the Spirit. That's what's on the box top of the puzzle of our life, right? That's kind of it. That's, that's the big picture. The problem is that in my life, and I could point at all of us, okay, but, but in all of our lives, sometimes the puzzle pieces, the individual choices, behaviors, the individual beliefs, ideas, the things we think about or vote for or invest in or care about. Sometimes what's really honest is that the pieces don't really add up to the picture. Am I making sense? And so I want to talk to you tonight about what God is doing in our lives as we look at the story of the Apostle Paul speaking specifically to the church in Philippi. We call it the book of Philippians. And in the third chapter, something happens where Paul has been teaching them what the box top is supposed to look like on the puzzle. He's been teaching them the big picture, what it means to follow God, love Jesus, be forgiven by his blood, and live under the direction and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He's been teaching them that. He taught them that in the beginning. When he taught them that in the beginning, they gave their lives to it. They, they, they succumbed to the grace of Jesus, and they became Christ followers, and they formed a church, and he developed leaders, and now he is gone. And word has gotten out in this story that someone has come into town, and they're messing with the individual pieces of the puzzle. They're making a little change here. They're suggesting another uh, difference of opinion here. Let's shift the theology here. And all of a sudden, what Paul is concerned about is in the Philippian church. If they don't stand strong, if they don't stay together, if they don't remember what they've been taught, then in the long run what might happen is that their pieces will form a different puzzle. Okay? Before we go there, there I want to talk to you about some specific things. Uh, in the scriptures, there is a, a theme, uh, the word blind is used over and over and over. And it's used in lots of different ways. Like, for instance, if someone can't see, they're blind. That's a very literal, factual, specific way of using the word blind. But the word blind is used in other ways. In the scriptures, if someone is misguided in life and maybe figuratively headed down the wrong path, they might be described as blind. 
If someone is uh, under the influence of a bad teaching and they're doing what they think is obedience, and they're trying hard and living out of faith, but they're doing so with a teaching that's wrong, the Scripture sometimes describes them as blind. Okay, so this metaphor of blindness is a backdrop for the passage that we're going to look at today. Uh, when you guys are blinded by something, can you think of this? Uh, the, the most often time in which I feel blind is when something happens in the middle of the night and I'm the dad and I have to get up and go check on it, right? And I like, we sleep in utter darkness, you know what I mean? I like darkness, that's how I sleep. And so if I get up, and I have to go somewhere and check on something and look around and that kind of thing. For the first few moments, I'm doing this, right? Where is, where is everything? You know what I mean? Have you ever, you ever, you know what I'm talking about? Blindness. You don't know what your next step is. In that case, what does it take to heal blindness? In my case, in the middle of the night, what do I have to do to overcome the blindness? Uh, <laughs> what do I have to do? Turn on the light. That's right. You have to turn on the light, okay? And so when the light comes on, the darkness goes away and you can see. This brings us to another metaphor in Scripture, and that is the metaphor of light and darkness. In this particular passage, you guys, these two things work together. Blindness is that which keeps us from moving in the right direction, seeing the right thing, and going down the right path. And darkness is the thing that makes us blind, okay? And so, like I told you last week, God is very direct and very specific in saying that one of the reasons that the church operates the way it does, one of the things that God wants from us is he wants us to shine like a bright light for the world so that, and here's the kind of the understood meaning, is so that fewer and fewer people will be blind. Okay, so that more and more people have the opportunity to see, so that more and more people can go where God wants them and do what God desires in their life and ultimately meet Jesus and spend eternity with him. That's the goal of shining. Okay, let me read some things to you about blindness. These are just some things the scripture says about blindness. Matthew 15, 14, Jesus is speaking. He's very upset with the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the ones who should have been enlightening everyone around them, but they were not. He says to them, they are blind guides leading the blind. And if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into a ditch. Okay? That's what he says. Blind guides leading the blind. If one blind person leads another blind person, they're both misguided. And they both fall in a ditch. You see what I'm saying? Job 29, 15. These are just a few verses about blindness. Uh, Job 29, 15 says, in Job's description of saying, God, I've tried to be a good guy. I attempted to do the right thing. Job says, I served as eyes for the blind. You see, this is a description. In Deuteronomy 27, 18, it's a pretty harsh verse. It says, cursed is anyone who leads a blind person astray. Cursed is anyone who leads a blind person astray. Uh, Romans 11, in talking about God's frustration with people's sin and misguidedness and doing things wrong and in his face, he says that he chose to let their eyes go blind so that they could not see. That's not literal, that's figurative. The idea of us coming to a place where we feel like we're constantly walking around in a pitch black room. We don't know what to do and we don't know what's next and we don't know why we keep kicking things, falling over things and hurting ourselves. There are many others that I could read on this topic. Isaiah 35, 5. Uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 42, 19 says, who is as blind as my own people, my servant? He goes on to say, who is as blind as you? That's a big cut down. One of my favorites is Romans 17, I'm um, 2, 17 and through 20, who he's talking to the Jewish leaders. He says, you who call yourselves Jews are relying on God's law and you boast about your special relationship with him. Uh, you know what he wants. You know what is right because you've been taught. You are convinced, you are convinced, he says, that you serve as a guide for the blind and a light for people who are lost in darkness. But then he basically goes on to say, the truth is you are as blind as they are and you are leading the blind from the perspective of being blind. And he's already told us what happens when a blind man leads a blind man. You see what I'm saying? 
Blindness plays a part in the Apostle Paul's life. Some of you will remember the story, but the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He was, he was aggressively harming the church, doing everything he could to put it down. And he's walking on a road to the city of Damascus one day, and God strikes him blind. The scripture says something about scales on his eyes and he can't see. And for a few days, he walks around physically blind. Do you see how the metaphor and the reality are working together here? God is saying to Paul, you think you see clearly. You think you know what I want. You think you're doing the right thing and you're doing it to the best of your ability. But the truth is you're blind, okay? And then when Paul submits his life to Jesus and says, I will follow you, I will do whatever you want, the scales fall off and his vision comes back and now he can see. The lights come on. All of that is the backdrop for what's happening in the third chapter of Philippians. That is all the background of what Paul has said, what he has experienced, what he has taught. And now as he sees men coming into the church in Philippi trying to mess with the pieces of their puzzle, he starts realizing that someone needs to say something. Someone needs to say something now, or people who actually can see now are going to become blinded by what is happening, and he speaks out in a very harsh way. Paul has the reputation of being a pretty rough guy, of being kind of harsh, but he's not always. He, he sometimes is very tender. Most of the book of Philippians is very tender and kind-hearted, but the first couple of verses of chapter 3, he's mad. He's just angry, and he's not mad at the church in Philippi. He's mad at the people who are messes, messing with the, uh, with the pieces in the puzzle. And he calls them dogs. He says, there are dogs among you who are, who are trying to change the way you think. Now, in their context, here's what they were, this is the puzzle piece they were messing with. Okay, These dogs were saying that the men of the Philippian church, these are Greek people, they're not Hebrew, they're not Jewish, they've never been circumcised. Okay, You guys know what I'm talking about there? Never been circumcised. These men come into town and say, in order to really love God, in order to really be connected to God and use our language, in order to truly be saved, you have to be circumcised. Okay? Now, do you see how that one piece of the puzzle really matters? If in your great big picture of who God is and how we connect to him, it's all about what he did for us, not what we do for him. In the great big final picture uh, of, of the mountains and that kind of thing, and not the superhero that we told you earlier, in, in that great big picture, uh, doesn't it make sense that it's very important if somebody starts adding one piece of the puzzle and say, oh, well, by the way, you have to do this to be saved too. Okay, and, and, and then, by the way, there's another piece I need to add on. And then, oh, don't forget this other one. And all of a sudden, they're messing with the big picture, and they're downplaying the grace and mercy of God and upplaying things that don't amount to a hill of beans. Okay? And the Apostle Paul's angry. He's frustrated, and he comes after them. And he makes it very clear that he is not going to put up with people messing with the puzzle pieces of the church. Okay? Because the real big picture, it matters. Okay, having said that, this brings us to the place where the, the point of the day is, okay? I told you recently that God desires for us to be a people who are committed. That's the first step to shining, is that if we want to shine and thrive and do well in the faith, then we need to be a committed people. The second one for today is that we need to be a confident people. You and I should be a confident people. And the Apostle Paul discusses that confidence in the third chapter of Philippians. Here's what he's getting at. You need to know what the big picture looks like. You need to be sold on what the big picture is. You need to have the big picture in mind so that even if it's not drawn out for you and leaning up against the wall, like in my story, you can close your eyes and see it and it's there. And when someone, when someone hands you a puzzle piece that does not fit in your picture, you need to know it, recognize it, and toss that puzzle piece out the door. That's what he's saying. You need to have confidence. Well, let's talk about confidence. Confidence is not cockiness. These are different things, right? I don't know about you. I have known some Christians who were just straight up cocky, okay? I, I should rephrase the verb. I have been a Christian who was straight up cocky, 
Okay, I have been that guy. Okay, there's a difference between cocky, right, and, and confident. Uh, and we're going to get to the bottom of what that is uh, today. But confidence is knowing what it is that God desires, knowing what it is that God has planned, knowing how it is that God has done it, and then living your life out of that reality. Okay? I, I equate it this way. Let's go back to the puzzle pieces. Uh, sometimes we live life like, like our Christianity is just a, a bunch of loose puzzle pieces. Okay? And we have all of these individual and different beliefs and desires. And we say, and it depends on what your heritage is and where you come from and what kind of church you were raised in to exactly which puzzle pieces you have. But you have that you're not supposed to dance or you are supposed to dance peace. You know, you have that you're not supposed to drink or you can drink peace. You have the you're supposed to dress nice or it doesn't matter how you dress peace. You, you know what I'm saying? You have the King James only version of the Bible peace or the new international version peace or the whatever's cheapest at Lifeway peace. You know what I mean? You have that peace. You have uh, all of these different pieces. And in the long run, I think a lot of Christians are walking around with their hands full of loose pieces, but they have no idea what the big picture really looks like. And that's a dangerous way to live spirituality. It's a dangerous way to be because in the long run, what you'll end up doing is you'll choose one piece at a time. And it's so easy. It's so easy for uh, the people that that Paul called dogs to come in and mess with your pieces. And you don't even realize that the importance of this one piece or that those three pieces or something really genuinely change what your total picture looks like practically, okay? So we need a Christian worldview. We need a biblical worldview. We need to understand and know what is going on and what the big picture looks like. We need to be confident in it and we need to live out of that confidence, okay? Let's read the scripture if you would. Before I do, I define confidence as living with a clear vision, a well-lit path, knowing what to do and when to do it, knowing what you believe and why you believe it. That's another way of saying it. Seeing the entire picture and not just a pile of pieces. In, Rome, in, in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, the scripture says this. I once thought these things were valuable. Let me tell you what Paul's talking about. Uh, these dogs, if you will, who've come into town, they're bragging on all of these different things they've done that make them more spiritual than other people. They're bragging about that, okay? Here's what Paul says. This is great. Paul says, well, the truth is, if we were going to brag, I could out-brag them, okay? I scored higher on the ACT than they did. I was higher in my class. I'm smarter than those guys. I can run faster. I can jump higher. My, you know, my girlfriend's prettier. I mean, you know, my car's faster. All of the things that guys like to brag on, these are Jewish guys, so they're talking about things like, you know, how many verses they can memorize and that kind of stuff. So he's just, I, basically he's saying, if we were in a bragging contest, I could brag. But then Paul basically says, all of those things that I used to think mattered, those pieces of my puzzle, I threw those puzzle pieces out. Those puzzle pieces don't matter anymore. I once thought that these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ Jesus has done. Okay? Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as the New Living Translation translate this word, translates this word garbage, okay? Um, the, 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 this word is used only one time in the New Testament. It's, uh, the Greek word is skubalon. And uh, I'll put it this way. Uh, literal translation, if, if we all knew what skubalon means, there would be teenagers wearing t-shirts that say skubalon happens. Okay? That's, that's what the word means, Okay? That's what the word literally means. It is, it is literally, it's, um, I don't want to be too crass, but it's, it's human waste, okay? That's what that word means, literally, okay? So he says, all of those things that I used to brag on about myself, all of those things like how smart I am and all my achievements and how good I've been and all of the sins I didn't commit and all of the times I could have done a bad thing and I did a good thing, the truth is if you measure that versus the value of knowing the forgiving hand of the grace and mercy of Jesus, it's no more valuable than scubalon. Okay? Garbage. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. 
He says, for his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as scubalon, so that I can gain Christ. And because, and I want to become one with him, he says, I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law and being good. I have become righteous through faith in Christ. That's a big picture there. My righteousness comes through Jesus, not because of my behavior and my choices and my goodness. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ, he says, and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience resurrection from the dead. I'm just going to keep reading this third chapter of Philippians in verse 12. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Do you, do you feel and sense the confidence in Paul? about where his life is going, what makes his decisions, what's important to him, and what's going to come next in his life. All of that comes from Paul sees the big picture. He sees the big picture, and all of the little pieces are judged by the big picture, not the other way around. He says in verse 13, No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on. By the way, looking forward is another reference to the biblical metaphor of blindness. In other words, I can see where I'm going. Okay? That's what he's saying. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Then he urges the church. He says, let those of us who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. In other words, you already know what to believe. Okay, you already have the big picture. That's what he's saying. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many out there who conduct, whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of Christ. And again, this is when he gets kind of serious. He says they are headed for destruction. Their God is their stomach or their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life on earth. He says to the church, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. See, again, that's worldview. We are citizens of heaven, and we are eagerly waiting. It's a part of our daily expectation. We are waiting for Christ to come and get us. We are eagerly waiting for His return as our Savior. And then He says in verse 21, He will take our weak bodies, our mortal bodies, and He will change them into glorious bodies like His own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. So very quickly, let me give you some biblical guidance and advice on how to have the big picture and how to live life with confidence in order to be able to shine in your faith. The first thing you must do is learn to ask the right questions. Learn to ask the right questions. In this particular story, when the, when the guys he calls dogs come into town and go, you know you need to be circumcised, I bet there were some guys there going, I have a question. <laughs> right? You have to ask the right questions. Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to do that? If, if my salvation is upon Christ alone, then why do I have to do that? Why do I have to go through something like that if what Paul said was that my salvation is based on grace through faith? Tell me why. That's a good question. But I think that sometimes we as Christians are afraid of questions. Sometimes I think that we're afraid that by asking a question, we will be deemed or viewed as a rebel, you know, or that, or that we have no faith or that, that we're doubting something, you know. 
In fact, sometimes I think that we misguide ourselves by thinking that doubt is a bad thing. Well, some doubt is a bad thing, but you know what? I don't think doubt as a whole is a bad thing. There are lots of things in my life that I am assured of now, but the reason I have assurance now is that I had doubt then, and I asked the question, and I sought after the answer. And when I found the answer, I had confidence in the answer. But if I had lived life with a hidden doubt that I never told anybody about, and I didn't ask anybody, and I go through life with this constant struggle, knowing that there are pieces of my puzzle that are nothing but a question mark, and I'm not trying to fill in those pieces of the puzzle, I'm not seeking to understand how that fits or how that works, I haven't asked the right question. The first step to living life with confidence is to not be afraid to ask the right questions. Okay? Find someone to ask them of, listen to their answer, find someone else to ask them of, listen to that answer, and then develop and grow in what you believe. Because you ask the question and you get the answer. Okay? So the first thing we all need to do, uh, Lakes Campus, Edible Campus, we need to ask the right question. The second thing is we have to come to grips with what we believe. We have to come to grips with what we believe. Now, I know that there are lots of issues out there, at least in my life, where if you were to ask me, Brad, what do you think of transubstantial something else? I would go, I would try to act smart. You know what I mean? I would try to come across like I know all the angles. And then I would end with, I don't know. I'm not quite sure. So I'm not saying that you're going to attain some sort of ability to have all of the answers to all of anyone's questions ever. When I say, um, come to grips with what you believe, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that any of us have the capacity to know what we believe about everything all the time, okay? So you do have to get comfortable with saying occasionally, I don't know. But in the big picture stuff that we've been talking about, who is God, how does God react to us, how does God change our lives, how does salvation work, where do we go when we die, why is the church important, that kind of thing, those are questions that we ought to ask and get answered and choose what we believe and know what we believe, and have a system of what we believe. The scripture goes so far to say is that we need to know what we believe about things so that when other people have questions, we can answer them. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, let me call the pastor. <laughs> you know, it's not, let me, let me call him. He'll know the answer to that question. I mean, sometimes you need to do something like that, but a lot of times the answer to the question someone has, you already know the answer, okay? So you give it with confidence and with love. We ask the right questions. We come to grips with what we believe. And then we live our life with assuredness, with confidence. We live our life to live the life that is that picture on the box. We live our life to fit in that picture that fits what God has taught us and told us to believe. Uh, in fact, some of the greatest problems in my spiritual life and maybe in yours come from when we live our life as if we aren't going to fit that picture. That's when our puzzle pieces don't match our big picture. When that happens, what ends up happening is that maybe we become a hypocrite. We say we believe this, but we behave like this, you know? Or maybe we become a pushover. We say we believe this, but when we are tested or tried, we're willing to do whatever we have to do to avoid conflict. You know, there are lots of problems that can come from us not living our life with assuredness or confidence of what it is that God has taught us to believe. And I'll close with the last thing. After we ask the right questions, after we take hold of what we believe, and after we live life around and wrapped with and connected to what it is that we believe with assuredness and confidence, this one's important, so really, really get this. Calvary City, get this one, okay? You ready? Stay open to learning. Stay open. Because on your best day, on your best day, you're still going to have pieces that don't match. <laughs> and it might take a good friend or someone in your river group or a sermon that you might hear or a Bible study that you might do or a quiet time when you're praying with God and God reveals something to you. It might take one of those moments to refashion your peace. You know, your little puzzle piece. And it might be that the, the color of the piece is right, and it might be that the picture on the piece is right, but it might be that the, you know, the little knobs, the little things that are on it, it might be that one's pointing the wrong way, or there's something that you need to shift just a bit. 
and we have to stay open to learning. See, uh, being confident in what you believe is not the same thing as being cocky. It's not the same thing as being hard as a stone, and it's not the same thing of losing your ability to, to learn, okay? Uh, for instance, I say jokingly, this is kind of my thing, I say I am absolutely 100% sure that 80% of my theology is correct. The problem is I don't know which 80% it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? At least 80%. I'm sure at least 80% of what I believe is right on. The problem is I am not so confident in which 80%. So life has to be lived, although it is with confidence in knowing what you believe and moving forward, in the midst of that confidence, there's an openness to be changed, an openness to learn. Not just become some snazzy guy comes in and offers you a different piece of the puzzle, like the dogs in Philippians, okay? Not that. But because God reveals to you and you have guidance and direction and you share it with people and in the long run, you learn from the church, okay? You learn. If we're going to be a church that shines, if we're going to be people who shine in our life, and by shine I mean if we're going to light the way for other people so that they can find their way to Christ, if we're going to be that, then we're going to have to be a people who are committed, we talked about previously, but we're also going to have to be a people, uh, you ready, for this who are confident. Would you pray with me?